Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today on the bench, I'm going to try an experiment here. I want to check the step response of these ubiquitous little op amps. You know, these common op amps. Usually the dual type, such as the NE5532. I have the TL072, LM833, and LM4562. These are common op amps you see in audio circuits. Like I say, they're the dual type. I'm just going to check one channel of them and see how they do in a step response test. Now you can put these op amps under a bunch of different tests to see how they perform, but more interested in what's known as a step response test. So what is a step response? Essentially, you're putting a voltage in to the input of the amplifier at one level, and it quickly changes to another level. In other words, it steps from one level to another level, and that's how you get the name step response. You're probably already aware that there's a certain periodic waveform that meets that criteria perfectly, and that would be a square wave, because while well, a square wave have, has one voltage level, quickly transitions to another level, transitions back, and you know continues that cycle. So that'll be perfect in using for our step response test. Now a step response test doesn't necessarily only apply to electronic circuits. It also applies to mechanical systems and even biological systems. They want to put a sudden transition, whether that be a voltage or a uh, physical position of something or a pressure, things like that, and see how the system responds to that. And it delves into what's called control theory. And I'm really only scratching the surface here. We're just going to talk about step response with the operational amplifiers and kind of limit to some of the different types of responses I would expect to see. So here's a drawing of a few examples of output responses I would expect to see from a step response test. And there could be a lot more. But for this test, I'm just looking for these types of responses. Now the first waveform here is ideal, where you have nice squared off edges, instantaneous transition to the different voltage level. In the real world, of course, that can't be possible because nothing happens instantaneously. The next waveform, you're showing a band-limited response. You know, the corners are rounded off because the frequency response is not infinite. And the uh, rate of change is a slew rate. In operational amplifiers, there's a compensation circuit, which is designed to keep the operational amplifier stable. And it tends to limit its frequency response to some upper level. The next waveform here shows an overshoot. Again, that has to do with negative feedback, and you know, nothing's instantaneous, so it might overshoot a little bit before it comes back and corrects the output to the voltage level that was intended. Next is a ring, and similar to an overshoot, but it, it kind of wiggles back and forth a little bit as it homes in to the voltage level it should be. You'll see ringing on the output of op amps especially when they're driving capacitive loads because the, a capacitive load is much harder for the amplifier to respond to and thus you get some ringing on the output. The next waveform will show more ringing and that's what I'm going to call marginal stability. Now when you get into the technical nooks and crannies of step response you'll hear stuff like over damped, under damped, critically damped, things like that. And you can kind of tell by the, the shape and the dampening of the ring. But in this case, I'm talking about if the ringing carries on too far and then the cat steps on the bench and causes the ringing to go haywire, I consider the stability of the amplifier to be marginal. I mean, it's just about to break out into full oscillation, and that's what the final waveform shows is an unstable circuit where it's oscillating. Because these op amps use a positive and negative side, part of the output stage handles the positive part of the cycle and part of the stage the negative cycle. 
you can actually have ringing on one side but not the other or of course it could be totally unstable and be oscillating on both sides on the upper and lower part of the waveform Here's the circuit I'm using. It's a non-inverting amplifier, gain set to 11. Square waves go into the input. And of course we have our uh, apply bypass capacitors. I'm using ceramic ones. Output's driving a one kilo ohm load. And I'll also add a capacitance. I believe I'm using a 10 nanofarad to see what the result is. Now I can spend a lot of time and try different loads, different capacitances, and things like that. But that takes an awful lot of time. I'm just going to test it with one capacitor in and out of circuit. And then the CATS probe just landed on the output, which will be probed with the scope lead. And since we're dealing with high frequencies, we'll use the 10x mode on the oscilloscope probe. Now we're using a 10 kilohertz waveform, and that's not that high frequency, but we're actually concerned with the high frequency components, you know, the ringing, you know, the quality of the edge. So we have to use the 10x mode on the scope. Here's my setup. Over here is a microcontroller program to give me the 10 kilohertz square waves. And I'm using the microcontroller because it has the fast transitioning square waves as fast as I can generate on my bench anyway. Have a trimmer to control the output level. And over here is the op amp circuit. Now I know that these socket boards are not the greatest for doing precision tests. You can't really get the grounds all that good on them, but you know, the low current of these op amps I think we'll be just fine using these. Now for proper stability testing and distortion, things like that, I would set it up on an etched board or have a board made with you know excellent circuit layout. But like I say, this will be good enough for my tests here. This is not a coil, it's just something I can plug the probe lead in and it'll contact the ground. Okay, so we need a baseline reference. So this is the signal coming out of the microcontroller. It goes through a trimmer so I can adjust the level. Plus I want to be able to see the, you know, the effect that the trimmer has on the waveform itself because it might affect the uh, response a little bit as well. And you might be asking why is it two straight lines and you know not your typical square wave. The reason for that is I have the scope triggering on the rising and falling edge so it makes it look like a box you can see the rising edge there mixed with the falling edge it just makes it easier to visualize on the scope so we got a pretty nice boxed waveform here the slightest bit of overshoot and it's at 10 kilohertz I already know that the signals fast enough I measured the slew rate which just just means the rate of change. So uh, let's adjust this here. And I crank this up. See, that's at one microsecond, and the rising and falling edges are still perfectly vertical. Okay, so now we're looking at the output of the first op amp, which is the NE5532. I'm supplying it with plus and minus 12 volt rails. We'll measure around 6 volt RMS. Now you can kind of see already that our vertical edges are skewed slightly. And a little bit of overshoot, so if I crank this up, you can see this is why I use the alternate trigger where I'm triggering on the rising and falling edges at the same time so I can see what's going on on both on uh, both edges here and we got a slight overshoot and now we're at one microsecond per graticule sweep rate and you can see here that's not a nice straight line is it so what I did now is add some capacitance to the output of the op amp and you can see there's some ringing and a little bit more on the bottom you know kind of get into marginal stability range there 
Eh, it's not too bad, I guess, but not looking that great. Now, another experiment I can do is unplug the power supply bypass capacitors. So, this is the positive rail supply bypass. And slight change. A little bit more ringing on top without it. And now I'll remove the negative rail. And look at that. We're ringing or oscillating there. It's uh, unstable. Let's unplug the upper one now. Now the uh, upper output line is still looking pretty clear. Let's speed that up. Yeah, I don't see any oscillating going on there. So you can see the importance of the supply bypass capacitors. Pretty interesting, without the supply bypass capacitors and the uh, output capacitance removed, it's not oscillating, which is quite surprising. It is driving some load. Of course, these op amps don't draw a lot of current, and the uh, filter caps inside my power supply are helping, though I am running several centimeters of leads out to this board. Still pretty surprising. Does that mean you can get by without using supply bypass caps? Absolutely not. There's a whole lot of situations I would have to test this amplifier with. There's a bunch of different capacitor values, different voltage levels, different varying signal levels. You know, at clipping, it could oscillate. So yeah, just because it's stable here doesn't mean you want to ever try to do without supply bypass caps. Now we're looking at the TL072. There's no overshoot, but you know because it's so bandwidth limited, you can see the rounded edges here. That's one reason because it's slow, so slow to come up. It's not going to overshoot. If I crank this up to uh, one microsecond per division, yeah, not a real fast op amp, is it? Let's put a load capacitance on the output. Okay, it's dealing with that okay. Not too bad. Because it's such a slower amplifier, you can see the slowness in the ring there. But it does stable out. You know, I can try a bunch of other capacitors and, you know, maybe find one where the amplifier is much less stable. But anyhow, let's remove the positive side bypass cap no change at all and uh, just pull the negative side out <laughs> it's pretty stable I'll take out the load capacitance now so you can see how stable this chip is a lot of its stability is because it's such a slow chip we'll probably find that the higher performance the op amp the harder it is to stabilize it Okay, now you're looking at the LM833. I'm not sure when this chip came out, probably in the late 80s, maybe early 90s. And it was kind of an upgrade to the NE5532. Just a little bit better performance. And you can see the slew rate is, you know, not a big improvement over the 5532. And it's a minor overshoot. Very even looking slew rate and performance on both sides. You can see the slew rate at one microsecond. Now the interesting thing to me is what's going to happen when I put the capacitive load on the output. Okay, well, it's interesting the slew rate is a little slower rising, but it's still pretty fast falling. And there's some ringing. Looks quite similar to the 5532. Let's unplug the bypass caps. The upper one has really didn't make any effect. The bottom one, yeah, it's doing some weird stuff here. Let me plug that back in to see what happened. There's when it's plugged in and when I unplug it. Yeah, there's some uh, minor oscillation on the top side. When I say bottom side supply cap, I mean the negative rail. I just do that out of habit. I'd say that's not stable. There's some light oscillation going on there. 
See up here. You turn that up. You can see that. Last but not least is the LM4562, which is billed as a high performance audio op amp. So we're uh, looking at very good performance here. No overshoot. Uh, we'll go to the one microsecond. You can see the slew rate is pretty good. It's better than the other ones. Let's see what happens with the capacitive load. Surprisingly, it's not ringing. I figured uh, being a high performance, high speed op amp, we'd have more problem with ringing. But, you know, in my test jig here, there's just a minor overshoot, a slight amount of ring. Not too bad at all. But what will happen without the supply rail capacitance? That ah, went unstable with, without that one. So you can see how these high performance chips really need their bypass capacitors. I mean, they all do, but this is just kind of an experiment to see what they do. I took the negative rail cap out and you can see it's oscillating there as well. We lost, it looks like we lost some of the uh, oscillation on the top side. Okay, plug the rail caps in, remove the load cap. Just a gorgeous performing chip. You know, we're only looking at one aspect of the chip. You know, it can handle loads better, swing closer to the supply rails, uh, very low distortion. I've always said that the LM4562 was a gift to the audio community. Now, for some odd reason, there's some people out there that don't want chips in their solid state circuitry, which makes zero sense to me. I know that there's these discrete op amp boards you can buy that plug in. You know, they'll have discrete circuitry and they'll claim all these fancy things, but you can't really match transistors as well as you can do on a mon monolithic chip and they can even laser etch for precise performance. And one thing with these discrete op amp boards, they seem to skirt around some of the specifications too. They, you know, they don't show everything. One odd thing though is you don't see that chip used in a lot of even professional sound boards and things. The reason is it's kind of expensive. I mean, it's it's not super expensive, but when you compare it to a Jelly Bean NE5532, it's a lot more expensive. And the NE5532 has really excellent audio performance as it is. So, uh-oh, we got a bench marauder here. It's gonna <laughs> it's gonna interrupt my video. Wow! What happened? You got hungry? Oh, don't knock the camera over. We got a snicker on the bench. It's going to pester me for food. Meow. What? It's going to yell at me. Meow. Yeah, you were sleeping. It was great when you were asleep. Meow. It was running around the house like it was crazy this morning. 14 years old. I think he had it in him. I can go on and on with these things with a bunch of different tests. But I've always found significant difference in the NE4562 as compared to the older chips. Even though the older chips are still well beyond good enough for audio purposes. I just thought it would be interesting showing some of the differences between the op amps using the step response test. And, you know, kind of seeing what happens when I put a capacitor load across the output. And uh, unplugging the supply bypass caps. Now with my little bench top preamp here, I'm using an NE5532. It's socketed. I could change it out if I wanted. But, you know, it's more than good enough. So you'd have to determine if the extra couple dollars cost of the chip or whatever the price difference is, is worth it to you to use in your circuit or not. Well, that's going to do it for this one. Give Snickers some food, so leave me alone. And we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.